Welcome. Come on in here. It's exciting to have every one of you in this room. We're going to talk here about a GraphQL today. I'm excited about GraphQL. It's one of those things that I uh, literally, up until recently, just never looked into, uh, particularly because I guess I had no reason to. Uh, for the most part, like I, I experimented. Well, to be honest, actually, I have experimented within the past on other other applications that I've worked on. I was like, yeah, this looks like a cool um, use case here, but never really dived into it that much, and certainly never explored it in the context of Magento. So today we're going to talk about a GraphQL, and I'm really excited about it. Welcome everybody. It's good to have you in here uh, today. So. See some people. I see Joseph, who's in the United States. Um, be great. I know Lukash is in Europe. Um, Praveen, maybe you want to stay where you are. And hey, honestly, nobody be shy. Like we're just gonna be family here. That's at least that's my, that's my goal. Um, and this is like the best thing we can do without being actually together in person. And I look forward to hopefully. I guess it'll probably be next year. Starting to see some of you all in person once again. Jignesh, good to see you there. Um, wonderful. Well, Acash, actually, we are just starting, so you did not miss much, if at anything. I always like to, uh, I don't know, greet everybody and ask where you're coming from, uh, how, how is everybody doing here, before we dive into the real meat of everything we're going to talk about. Very good. It's good to have you all here. I don't know how many of you came from our Slack channel, but I'm always a big proponent of encouraging people to join in there, join the conversation, answer questions on our Slack channel. My goal is for the Slack channel to be like the good Magento Stack Exchange. Like I'm not throwing shade at Magento Stack Exchange itself because and I know there's a lot of wonderful people there, but you just never know whether you're getting a good answer or maybe a not so good answer. So that's uh that's that, that's always the challenge there. Uh, but yeah, oh well, let's see here. Got a couple questions coming in. Lukash does having you on a side screen, oh, while well, writing integration tests, nice. Integration tests, yes, those are important to be writing. And I know we talked about them, what, two months ago? And I hope to dive into them a little bit more next month or the month after, we'll see. Um, but yes, we are going to, we would like to cover some more integration tests. And actually, something I'd like to talk about eventually is getting some other people to help with these these conversations because I think there's going to be uh well I'm I I can only know so much and I can research I can develop all that but having some other people come in here and be able to share what they're learning about stuff now we're talking now we're talking very good so without further ado I suggest we just jump in to this conversation and um as I always do this just so we have a clean start for the beginning of this so we can get rid of all of our uh, this my uh, talking there for a minute or two waiting for you all to show up uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to hide myself I'm going to show this in my slides and then we're going to just dive right on in up oh, hi there from the Philippines is that John I think John from the Philippines cool all right well we're gonna go ahead and get started and then we will um, talk about graph QL Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be here to chat with you about GraphQL. It's kind of, well, for a lot of people at this point, I don't think GraphQL is really something that's been worked through. And I took that as a challenge for myself. I'm very familiar with the REST API, and I use it all the time. I'm a big proponent. I'm pushing it. I love, I, I'm always suggesting people use the REST API. I think it uh, like it makes better front-end user experiences. Um, it can be faster response times, you know, there's obviously cases where it couldn't be faster, but um, the REST API is a really good solid resource for getting information from the back end to the front end, of course, machine to machine, like there's a lot of good use cases for the REST API. And so I've never really dealt, gotten into GraphQL. And I think part of that is that GraphQL is more associated with PWA, it's associated more associated with a front end application as opposed to, um, kind of these one-off modules that we that we write. It's part of the whole compiled Webpack uh, React type of applications. So as such, we don't really, I haven't really dealt much with it, but I realized that's a deficiency in my learning, and so I've determined I'm going to solve that. 
And so what I bring you here today is a conversation about what is GraphQL. Oh, let me pull up my slide. Where'd my mouse go? There we go. <laughs> well, what is GraphQL and how to create a new query in Magento and how to use it? So trying to take these in real bite-sized steps here. This is not going to be exhaustive. It's not going to tell you everything you need to know about GraphQL. Um, but my goal is that you come away with this with saying, okay, I have a project coming up and I can use GraphQL. Now, of course, the question is, is GraphQL the best thing for you to use in your next project? Well, of course, that depends. We're going to talk about some of these use cases, some of the purposes for, for GraphQL. Oh, hey, Dan, welcome. Come on in. All right, so what is GraphQL? It's this word that's thrown around all over the place. Uh, it's more or less the holy grail of PWA. It's how the PWA interacts with the back end. And that's really simplifying things, but it's kind of kind of uses JSON. Not really, it's a different form of JSON. It's called Graph Q Query Language and allows us to request data from the server, very specific data from the server. Let's look at uh, some of the benefits that it comes with using GraphQL. And I'm gonna compare these benefits to a REST API. So the first one is, is that it is strongly typed. And I like this benefit because um, there is the chance of running into some problems when it comes to an integer versus a float. If we can strongly type some of this out, well, that's helpful. Now, of course, in REST, we had data structures, but those data structures still didn't have strong typing even at a scalar level. And so I, I find that GraphQL can be really helpful from a strong typing perspective, i.e. reducing errors, rounding errors, et cetera, et cetera. As such, then the second point, I kind of already started jumping into this, is that it is highly structured. So we can have, we can embed um, basically service, I, I'm saying using the word service contracts. I'm using, I, we can embed service contracts into other service contracts, et cetera. That's how we would think of it in relation to Magento terms. But it's very, um, there's a great hierarchy that is available with GraphQL. You can embed, it's more, it's pretty, actually, I would say it's somewhat similar to SOAP in that way. REST is the service contracts as they apply to REST is very loosely defined, right? Magento uses the is it, uh, the input data processor and I think output data processor. It uses those to take a REST JSON uh, or JSON object through the REST uh, through a REST um, uh, message and it transforms it into service contracts. But the, none of that is actually exposed to the front end, so it's left up to Magento to make those assumptions. And we, it can get us into trouble sometimes. As such, having this very highly high high level of structure to find on the uh, for the uh, front end to use can only help things out. Um, another thing is you can pass arguments to subquery. So in a in a REST, it's just a JSON object, and while you, I don't know, you can pass extra data. You, we make it work with REST. A cool part of GraphQL is that you can just pass in arguments into subqueries to get like a combine multiple queries into one call. The benefit of that is, is that you don't have to hit an endpoint quite as often. You can get more data in one sitting. GraphQL is call it, is kind of forward compatible as much as that can be, right? Uh, we're talking about in a place where stuff is changing very rapidly. So the the idea here is that, and we're going to look at all of this in a little bit more detail. I'm just trying to get you the big picture up front, and then we'll dive in exactly how this looks in code. But the idea of with it being forward compatible is that instead of creating a new version, which is one way to make REST compatible with future versions, right? In, in uh, when, we're, when we create our API endpoints in webapi.xml, we usually put like a v1 slash and then whatever in there. And technically speaking, we could create a v2 slash whatever. We could put all that in there. But that's not necessarily required with GraphQL because the idea is if you need some, to add something in the future, you just create a new attribute. You create a new field that can be queried. And then APIs that are compatible with that 
uh, can select that new field to be queried. So uh, that is of uh, the benefits. Let's talk about the problems. Why should we not use GraphQL? Because, hey, I mean, we're looking at this. It's like, well, let's start using it for all purposes. But I think, at least for right now, there is a balance, uh, and it's not necessarily something we should use all the time. One of the big problems, and I don't have it listed out here, is the fact that there is not an easy client for this to be used in our knockout modules, i.e., until we start building out more of our of the Magenta front end with, abs with Webpack, i.e., PWA of one sort or another, it's kind of hard to query GraphQL because it's verbose. Now, feel free to um, share if you have seen any tips on this. I have yet to see a good way to do this. I could be missing something. Uh, again, because I'm just coming up to speed on this. I'm sharing with you my learnings, and I'm hopeful that you, know, you would be so bold as to share your learnings in this conversation as well. So that's kind of the biggest impediment. Is it a 100% impediment? No. Because I'll show you today, I created a small query, show you how to do that, and I'm pinging it from the front end of the checkout or of the cart page. So yeah, it's 100% possible. Uh, it it works, uh, and um, it, there's it works actually quite well. And it's not too difficult to create a GraphQL endpoint. That said, it doesn't. It is not as uh, streamlined into the as it is in Magento. So. Is that where's the trade-off? That said, I would suggest I would recommend everyone who's participating in this, and it's so good to have all of you participating. This makes me very happy. I would suggest every one of you take some time, the next couple of weeks, whatever, and write your own query and implement it in one way or another. If it, if it's a side project, very well. If it makes sense and it's a good use of your resources, your time to implement it on a in a merchant project. Very well, very well. That would be good too. So just consider if there is a way that you can um, implement GraphQL even just one time into, into this. All right, I have a question saying, um, Joseph said, do we have anyone else losing the, the stream? Well, the funny question is I can answer that question uh, and it looks like everything is up and working from my side, but perhaps um, something else is happening. So I'm not seeing any other comments come through saying it's broken. this opportunity to get myself some water. Okay, um, does anybody uh, have, does anybody, uh, or let me just say this, is, okay. Perhaps there was a problem, that would be too bad. Okay, I do occasionally have it where my internet router drops for like a minute or two, and I certainly hope that wasn't the issue. I didn't get notifications saying that it was down, but uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your patience there. So uh, let's answer a couple of questions, and we'll continue our conversation here. Uh, which is faster, uh, GraphQL or REST? Yeah, that's the problem. It's not really something that one can really answer on that. Uh, GraphQL is supposed to be faster, but one of the... I say supposed to be, but one of the f advantages of GraphQL is you can select which fields you want to return. So, for example, if I was to ping request a product, I can select, say I want the SKU, I want uh, the price from this. As opposed to with REST, I ping a product, I get the SKU, I get the price, I get the name, the description, I mean, I get everything. The whole kitchen sink is literally dumped in my front yard. And is that a problem? Well, no, not really, because you just you just use the SKU and the price. But is it a problem? Well, yes, we're downloading a whole bunch of extra information. So at the end of the day, GraphQL will be faster, especially for limited data connections. And in PWA, there's a lot of information going back and forth. The one other thing that I've seen as far as an advantage of GraphQL, and I didn't specifically call this out in my slides earlier, is GraphQL is very much designed for a PWA type of application, which means it's in a, used in a very different context. Um, I am not aware, hmm, I might be questioning myself on this one. 
I was going to say, I'm not aware of a way to get a product on the front end of via REST. But I think, if I remember correctly, actually there is a setting that enables or disables whether a product is products are able to be fetched on the front end, i.e. with anonymous access. With GraphQL, it's carte blanche. You can do that. So uh, in that way, well, if we needed to actually access a product, we didn't want to write a new, uh, well, I'm, product is probably a bad example in this case, uh, per, perhaps some customer information or something along, along those lines. We can use, actually use GraphQL right now to get, get access to some of that information as opposed to building it out with REST and it's already available in GraphQL. All right, uh, let's, let's see. I think I had another question in here. Uh, uh, what is Willis talking about? Oh, that's a good, I like that screen name, by the way. Um, is it feature complete? Can you create a React, React client and just call uh, GraphQL? Yes, definitely. And I'll show you an example here of not a React client, but calling GraphQL from the front end, and you'll see that it works. My understanding is, I don't know exactly as far as the Magento features, as far as it being that being complete. There was a roadmap somewhere, and I cannot remember where, off the top of my head where that is. But there, I think there is a, a, a feature list saying what is left to build out for GraphQL. But as far as I'm aware, it's pretty well feature complete at this point. Okay. Uh, let's talk about something that was interesting for me to work through, and that is authorization slash authentication. GraphQL, uh, well, I was expecting GraphQL to have a more robust authentication system. It, uh, because, like, how do we prevent access from people to people getting this type of information? And the reality is, it's not designed for that type of access, uh, for the most part, um, or at least at, at at the forefront. REST, in my opinion, is kind of the opposite. REST is designed from the very beginning uh, with using the um, like the bearer token, that sort of thing. GraphQL can use that, but there's no, as far as what I'm aware of in Magento, there's no authentication mechanism. You look in webapi.xml for REST, and you see our, our resource. We can set it to be a Magento resource, or anonymous, or self, etc. But that is not available in GraphQL. That is left to each endpoint to be able to figure out whether the person has access to this given uh, to this given information. So that said, you can use all the existing authentication types. You can use a bearer token. You can use uh, a customer session. You can use anonymous. But it's up to the endpoint. It's up to you as you're building out your uh, GraphQL uh, endpoints in order to make sure that the person or the entity requesting this actually does have that access. And so that's kind of a diff bit of a different paradigm shift. It's it's assuming by default, if you write a REST, uh, or, or, oops, I get confused here. If you write a GraphQL endpoint or a resolver in this case, you are assuming, it. Magento assumes that this has access to it, um, free access to it. So just keep that in mind as you are building this out. Um, Yes. Okay. So we're, let's um, dive in and let's look at an example. Uh, let's look at an example. There we go. REST request. Of course, I didn't make this big enough. We will do this. All right. So here is the basic, probably what you're going to use most of all is a query. In this case, we are querying CMS blocks. We are filtering by Identifiers. Yeah, we'll put this up there and reformat a little bit here since it's a bigger screen now. Okay, or a bigger size. There we go. Yes, nice. Okay. Great. And I dropped my bracket there. Okay. And I need to show you my screen. There we go. So uh, we are querying by we have our so here's our query. We have our CMS blocks. And uh, we have we're saying what identifiers we want to block IDs. And then in our items, for every item, we want to retrieve the identifier, the title, and the content. Now, what, is comes, what comes back out of here is basically a JSON response that looks pretty similar to a REST request response. So, in theory, and basically, this is more or less the same output. It's just a, a different input, a more powerful uh, way to query this. So, on the output side, we, get, we have our data, and we have our CMS blocks, which matches to the query name. We have our items. 
that matches to our uh, request, what data we are requesting from the endpoint. And then here is the information that comes back with this. Pretty simple. So this is one type of query. Now, the question is though, how does this map into the back end? Like, okay, so like I said, we're going to go ahead and create our own query. Where do we find this type of information? Well, we can find this by going into the core code. And pretty much most modules have a graph QL or have a, there's another module with that basically the same name, but with a suffix of graph QL. So for example, here's a CMS, here's uh, the CMS graph QL. So we're going to drop into here. Um, we see that there is a graph QL area, so we can target preferences or uh, plugins just for this graph QL area. But here is the key file that is, that is available here. Etsy slash schema dot graph QLS. And I want to focus in on a couple of these aspects here. So we'll ignore store config for our conversation today. Basically, you can, this is extending the store configuration request that is again available as an endpoint. We're not going to get into extending, but the real quick short story is, is that these graph, the schema.graphqls files are actually merged together. So if you want to extend CMS page in this example, like this CMS page type, a strong type that is that can be returned to the front end, uh, you would basically just include this in your uh, your own schema.graphqls. All right, so here is our type. We have a type of query. And inside of here, we're going to focus in on, I'm going to drop, make, oopsie. I'm going to bring, drop this down a couple lines so you can see this a little clearer. So we have our CMS blocks type. So this type, uh, we have, so we have type query and then type CMS blocks. This type references, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's this one here references our type down here. Now, the CMS blocks is the query name, which matches up to uh, right here, CMS blocks. Here is our CMS block query. And it accepts a parameter of identifiers, which is a type of string, but an array of strings. So if we took out the braces here, it would just be a, well, so if we did something like that, that'd be just a string that's returned or a array of strings. Now. One thing to note, if you do make a change to your schema.graphqls file in your own module, make sure to clear the cache because otherwise uh, those won't just, it just won't work. So keep that in mind. Um, but uh, we have, we are returning an array of strings and well, it is, it accepts array of strings, which I am demonstrating here. We have our identifiers and we have the, uh, the array of strings. We could obviously do one more, whatever we want. This is kind of like our query. We're saying, hey, we want all CMS blocks that match these identifiers. And then it returns a type of CMS blocks, plural, which is has a type of, which returns an array of CMS blocks. So it's actually fairly similar to a, uh, well, actually, on, and honestly, the uh, doc blocks for, or the annotations for uh, the REST, um, Service, con service contracts via REST. So we can specify an array of a specific type. It's just that instead of using service contracts, we're more or less duplicating our efforts here into the schema.graphqls. Uh, like, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that's the only way to do it. It'd be really, really cool if this was like auto done for us. I'm just not aware of a way to do that. Yes, I see a couple of uh, questions coming up here. Um, Gene and Shibin, I'll get to those in just a minute. So. Uh, We'll actually be getting in and setting a breakpoint here, and so you'll see exactly how this works here in short order. So, this is how this is defined. We can you can make this as deep as you want. So, content could be an array of strings. It could be a type of something else. You basically build this out according to whatever data structure you need, and that is really cool. Like I, I don't know. I, I find this. I think this is going to be helpful. I just wish it was a little easier to query on the front end, again, in non-PWA applications. Um, but I look forward to figuring out a way if that is possible uh, to do. So 
here is a very important key point. So let's say we need to, we're gonna get all CMS blocks that are available, for example, or just a couple that maybe one that went to inject in the header. But we have a problem. We don't exactly know where this information comes from. Now, you're probably noticing here in my, on my screen, we have a, what looks like a class name right here. It's like, ah, <laughs> this might be helpful. So Gene, listen up, We're ta I'm talking to you now, my friend. So grab this, and unfortunately, PHP Storm does not understand the double slashes is just an escaped value. So you have to go through and clean those out. Jump into here, and now we see a resolve method, which looks eerily similar to uh, resolver. So we set a breakpoint right here, and let's go fire off our request. Haha! -ha. This is the value of using xdebug, and I hope every one of you is very familiar with xdebug at this point. If not, shoot me an email, joseph at swiftauto.com. I am, I, okay, I have to take a brief, brief break here. I am so passionate about xdebug. Like, if any of you is not at using xdebug, uh, I don't, mm, just, just hear me out here. You are missing out. Like, you are missing out on life. Like, this is such a big deal. Your capability as a developer is going to at least double, and I think that's being pretty conservative. So, if you, don't, if you haven't been using xdebug, make sure. Email me, I have a free course that I pulled together on how to use it. Uh, thousands of people have used it already. It makes me so happy to know that, uh, that I can actually contribute to people's lives in this way. It is a tangible way. So use xdebug, you see me using it here, use it yourself too. So there's no excuse for not getting it done. It's, it shouldn't, okay, even if it takes a day, even if it takes a whole day, your, your Saturday this weekend to figure out how to use xdebug, uh, it's pretty well worth it. <laughs> it's really worth it. Okay, so what I wanna talk about now is we have our breakpoint set. Let's look at GraphQL from two perspectives. What's available in this resolve method and what, how did we get here? So let's look at the, uh, what's available actually in the resolve method first. We have this context. We have this context here. And we have user type, user ID, and extension attributes. So what is this user type? User type, and I realized I uh, closed out my, uh, very important uh, set of class notations here. User type comes from, oopsie, there we go, let me close this out, there we go. I, I have a problem with opening too many tabs and uh, that problem extends the subline uh, very severely. So, so uh, let's open this up. All right, so user type is comes from this enumeration, as much as PHP allows for that right now, this list right here. Um, this is in, you can write this down, user context interface. So write down user context interface. So go take a look there. So this user type comes uh, from this. So user type one here is user type of integration. In our query, we passed in our, an authorization. We set our bearer token to be this, to type, this token here. As such, uh, it's pretty easy to, uh, we can see, okay, well, this has been uh, authorized with this given user ID. Now we can, if we have the, uh, if it's authorized, well, let me just, we'll stop there. Um, what I'd like to now do is take the look at the context and I'm gonna jump to type source and we're gonna say, uh, actually we're gonna set a breakpoint here. There is no setters in there, so this seems to be an immutable class. So we, the only way to change the values is to create a new context. So I'm gonna stop this request I'm gonna start it up again because it's out, it's really important here to see exactly how these uh, this user information becomes available to your given GraphQL context. All right, so we have a breakpoint here and this is just standard debugging as we talk about in the book. Uh, we set a breakpoint to something that we know and then we back up and we find something that we don't know. So I'm gonna come up here we see that this is created, our object manager create passed in these values. User ID is one of those values passed in. And I'm going to set a breakpoint up here. So we see the context parameters uh, and context parameters uh, get user ID and 
there's no set user ID specified in here, so it pretty much has to be in this execute method. So we're going to stop it again. And we're going to, uh, yep, right here, send it. Clearly not here. And this is just setting the extension attributes. Okay, uh, this is interesting. This is add user in info to context. All right, so we have um, current user ID, uh, user context to get user ID. Let's jump in here. Uh, this chosen user context. And to be frank, if we are looking at the, um, like you can't see this up here. If we're looking at the, uh, well, actually we can see it uh, this with this, it's, it'll be a little bit small. We are now in the module authorization uh, slash model composite user context. So this is a great place to set a breakpoint and composite user context. We are here. We are looking for, uh, we are getting the user context. What what context, what, what provider can give us information about this user? So let's, dig, let's dive in here a little bit deeper. Uh, this user context, what user contexts are available? And we see three, we see the token user context, customer and guest. So token uh, is going to provide the information if we have passed up like a bearer token. That will be that will be available there. Customer session user context seems to indicate that it will try to initiate the customer session. And then finally, guest means, hey, this person did not authenticate whatsoever. So let's uh, step through each one of these. And real quick, just real quick, we'll see exactly how this works. All right, uh, because perhaps you've never stepped in this deep to the authorization part of Magento. And this, just so you know, applies to REST, SOAP, and GraphQL. It's the same for all of them. All right, we get our authorization header. And if there is two pieces to that, and here we have our bearer token, we have our token type. Uh, if it's not set to bearer, then of course it's gonna kick it out. It's gonna load that token uh, from, I, oh, I just stepped past it. I think it's oh, integration token, I think, uh, is the name of that, that table. It's gonna make sure this is a valid, legit token and set user data based off of the token, the user type. So our user type is one from this token, and it's a integration user type, and that's going to be the user ID. Set request, process request, user type. All right, uh, so it's now that it has a chosen user context, it will that will take it from there. Let's quickly jump to type source. We can see how this works in uh, the customer session, and basically get user ID just says, hey, is there a user ID that's available from the customer session? It's pretty transparent. So the customer session is spun up, gets the data for this user ID there. All that to say, we're gonna continue out of this. I don't wanna take more time there. We come up to this place and we now have our context with our user type and our user ID. So if you need to filter based off of any of this information or provide authentication authorization, this is the place that you can now do that based off the information you have in the context. So. Let's look and see how the rest of this works. We have a very important field called args, which you'll see this identically matches what is passed in via Postman. Our identifiers are these two. So we have identifiers of, uh, was this it's an array, and I, that transparently matches up. So get block identifiers. If there was no identifier specified, it's going to error out, i.e. this, this person cannot select or find all CMS blocks. There has to be an identifier specified. Uh, and maybe for some endpoints, all that you need to do is make sure that there's going to be some, the right data that's returned. So filtering might not be too difficult in your case. All right, so blocks data, uh, blocks identifier. It's getting this information. I'm not worried about what it's doing specifically. It's just how it's doing. We'll step through this here real quick. Uh, yes, there we go. All right, so it's just getting a search criteria builder getting the items from there and uh, the, getting the first item, filtering out the content, so basically rendering the content out and that's just a returning an array. Now, one thing that is helpful to notice here is we could start in start getting some discrepancies between uh, GraphQL or schema.graphqls and our service contract. And so by putting these field names here into our the serve the data contract, if you will, it can reduce some of those um, side effects. You're still going to have the 
you're still going to have these two different uh, uh, graph or schema that GraphQLS be different than your actual service contract. But by hard coding in these uh, field names, it can it, it will allow you to be able to look up according to those field names, and it just gives you a little bit more context. It won't solve the problem, but it, it can help a little bit. All right, so you see, we're basically just returning an array back. That's how it works, and it's sent back to the front end in this fashion. So again, basically just looks very similar to a REST response. All right, so Gene, I hope that answered your question right there. So the best way to, to debug a, a, a GraphQL uh, request is to go find that GraphQL request. Honestly, the easiest way is to uh, do a search. We have CMS blocks. Uh, we can do a search in the code base if you want to find it quickly. Um, CMS blocks, and you can even do a uh, schema graph Q, graph QLS, and you see exactly where it's located, like super easy there. And you jump, grab this class, set a breakpoint there, and you are home free to begin your debugging session. GraphQL does not have any default caching. No, not, not off the bat. However, uh, caching is available uh, for this, and let me just drop this down so that you can see this. Every uh, value in GraphQL, you can specify a uh, doc block for that. Uh, and we can also uh, set the caching information. Uh, and if we have time at the end, I'll show you how the caching works. I don't think we'll have time. Uh, but basically, all you have to do is, well, we can just jump over there and show you this just to make it real quick. Because definitely, if we are querying a CMS block, there's no reason why it can't be cached. The response can't be cached. And we see our get identities. We have our resolved data, et cetera. So this is, follow this example if you need to cache data via GraphQL. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Dan asked, why is SOAP still being supported and used, by the way? Uh, that's a good question. I think, in my experience, and it's been a long time since I've used SOAP, uh, SOAP allows for, and I'm, and I'm totally missing even the, the terminology here, but basically it's, it's as if, the SOAP endpoint integrates directly into PHP, so you can call it like with a method call as opposed to, um, as opposed to having to build like a REST request. So you can just call it like endpoint arrow, um, do something, and then put your parameters in parentheses, and the the SOAP client takes care of sending the request and getting it back. So it's really really handy in that way. Uh, but past that, I don't know other than just legacy. All right, uh, let's continue on here. So we've seen how, to, how this works. What I always like to do is I'm jumping in and learning something. I'm like, okay, let's do this myself. Let's figure out what does it take in order to create a new GraphQL query. So I am using what's going to be available for all of you here. I am using my sample project for the art of e-commerce debugging this course that I'm putting together. And this course I wish I could say was available now. Uh, it's not. So hopefully very soon it will be available. And basically the idea of this is it takes the concepts we talk about in this book and it makes it as practical as possible. We step through some pretty interesting problems that are all built into the code base here. We step through those problems and we discover how to solve those problems effectively using the TAD framework, et cetera. So with this project as my basis here, I thought, you know, let's work through creating a new endpoint. Well, how do we make this practical? One of the modules that's included in, in this project is actually for the expert developer course, which is the gift card module. In that course, we go we go through the process of creating a gift card. We touch uh, a good major vast well a significant majority of the uh, areas of uh, Magento, and well, as a gift card, you have to purchase it, you have to use it as the to, to pay for stuff, et cetera. So let's go ahead and create a update to our system where, or to this module where we allow in the shopping cart to see is this gift card available to be used or what information do we have about this. Now, I will say it is quite basic and uh, it's not like the most fully featured thing, but it does demonstrate the point. So let's take a look at this. So in this case, we have our uh, 
check gift card, and we have a gift card here. Oopsie. Called test123. We're going to check it. It's going to ping our GraphQL endpoint, and uh, I don't need that breakpoint there anymore. We return it. So here is the response from this. Data gift cards, items, and we have our information here. What does the request look like? The request is ugly. Like, really, really ugly. But I will show you a better place to look at this request. And that is right here. Here's the request that we are sending up to our GraphQL endpoint. We have our gift cards query. We are filtering by the code. We are then requesting this information back out of there, as well as, actually, we don't need the, this information either. I was meant to take that out. So um, we just have the total count. As such, that's all that it really takes. I fetch this. You uh, have We have the URL that was passed into this via a uh, view model, and we're not going to get into that information right now. Pass the credentials, which, at least the way I've implemented it right now, I'm using the credentials to verify that this customer is logged in, so I have to include the credentials. So we get our uh, session cookie sent, which means that the session can be initialized, which means I can get access to the customer ID. Uh, and then we stringify the body. So it's kind of wonky, honestly, how this looks, because we take our, we pass in a query uh, JSON object, but we take this here, and I have it formatted nicely, so it looks nice for me here, as opposed to looks nice in... Um, well, I don't know if there would be a way to make it look nice in Chrome. Uh, but we're passing in our, our gift cards query here. So that's kind of the front end to it, but none of that's going to make too much sense until we look at what, what I did on the back side. So here is the way that I built this out. Let's just start with the query here. So we've, we are creating a new query, and you can name the queries whatever you want. It doesn't have to have anything to do with the endpoint. It's just a name. You set the name here. You need, to, you need to use the name here. Like, the name of the query has to match with the name of the query, right? <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. So um, we have a filter. Uh, and actually, I'm going to take this one out right here. We have a filter, which uses this new input type, uh, gift card attribute filter input. Uh, we could just... I, uh, we could just literally put a string here. And it's a matter of whatever you want to do for the title, or for the typing. So if we would just have a filter for the string, but to me it seemed a little more intuitive to have the filter be able to be specified. What are we filtering? And even if this was just one, uh, again, I'm still working on GraphQL, but I feel like I would still use an input object so then I can specify, hey, this is the code. Because otherwise, uh, let me go back to oops, my code here. We would just say uh, filter is this, and it's up to my interpretation, what is the filter? So this makes it, again, a little bit more uh, s specific as to what is uh, what we are filtering here. We have the status, and both of these are strings. Notice I have, a, a, a doc have the documentation here. All right, so this returns, again, this looks very similar to PHP, return types. This returns a type of gift cards. Now, notice this is plural, gift cards means that we can pass back multiple gift card entities, which that is then declared down here. There's no reason we have to pass back multiple gift cards. In fact, the, I'm doing this just to give you a demonstration of how, again, types, I'm going a little excessive here. If I was to build this, be building this out for a merchant, I would probably just directly return one gift card. Like, we are filtering for a gift card code, and this code will be required, as you'll see in... in the source code, it will be required there. So it probably would make just as much sense to pass back one gift card. Like we don't need to pass back multiple gift cards. Uh, and we could just, at that point, um, have that, the query could just be a code perhaps. So again, just to be a little more verbose, a little bit overboard, I'm including a gift cards object so we can allow for multiple gift cards to be returned. All right, so this gift cards object now has, has several properties. Uh, we have, oops, we don't need the page info there either. Um, we have our, our items, and that is an, returns an array of gift cards, an array of gift card to be very specific. Mm -hmm. So here, then, we have the properties that can be returned. If I wanted to extend this in another module, I would literally do something like this. And I would say, um, 
name, something like that. I don't know. String, just, just throwing that as, this out here. We'll take that off. And now gift card will, on the front end, will have name as another available attribute. So this is how we would extend it in another graph, our schema.graphqls uh, schema file. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at how this works from our resolver perspective. Okay, we can create all this information out, but we're going to get an error if there's no way to resolve this. So I created a new model resolver gift cards class. This is actually fairly simple. So basically, we went to implement resolver interface, and which includes this method definition right here. I am passing the arguments and the context into our locate gift cards. We're doing some error checking right here, actually. So this probably should be pulled out into a uh, separate. Well, into it. Well, let me just do that. That make that'll make me happy. <laughs> Having this a little cleaner here. All right, and one thing to note is I put this code in here just to show as a demonstration for we get the user type, we can see is this allowed. So for example, if we wanted to filter or allow all gift cards on the, on, from this request, then we would want to use the user type to make sure that this is a admin user and not just a front end user. So I'm taking this out because I ultimately have it in, had it included here, but then just so you know, and this is a little word to the wise here, I started running into a really strange issue. That strange issue was whenever I hit the GraphQL endpoint, it logged me out. Seriously, it logged me out. So I don't know if it's a lack of understanding as far as why this was the case, but I did find here in our, uh, let's see here, customer, uh, module customer GraphQL, I found a clear sesh customer session after request. Maybe one of you can help fill me in as far as why this code would be in here. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm guessing there's a really good reason, but clearing out the customer session was not necessarily something that I had in mind. It was, yeah, it was a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit, uh, uh, took me a little while to figure out what the heck was happening there. So uh, in that time, I had just returned truth to this. But my idea here was we are only going to return gift cards that are, well, if the user type is, an admin or a uh, admin or uh, an OAuth token, then we can return that, and we probably want to do even a little bit more error checking there. But otherwise, if there is a user ID and the user ID equals the gift card customer ID, well, then that can be returned at that point. So, you know, uh, this we take our gift cards, we are returning them, uh, and then it is we have an array map calling uh, convert gift card to data and we're just returning all the values. Again, an array that ultimately, as I'm seeing this, I built out uh, my, uh, let's see, we should have used our uh, data contract uh, information here. So things like gift card interface ID. So just again, to keep things very streamlined and straightened through that. Then uh, we, we can ping it. And there we go. We have a, uh, response out of this. So you'll see it's really not that hard. And, uh, and it's, I think it's honestly pretty cool. Like the one question I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. I meant to research this, but I forgot beforehand was does graph, how does GraphQL work with the product repository is all attributes loaded or is it just the attributes that you request? Because remember here we can add whatever attributes we want and those are just the ones that are going to be transferred across the wire. The other ones are going to be filtered out. Now, we pass all attributes to the request. We can pass all those in, but at the end of the day, those attributes are uh, filtered out before they are sent back to us. All right. So uh, I have a couple questions in here before we continue on. What is your experience with writing a uh, GraphQL client in PHP? I have no experience with that. I will be... I, Try to be very straight with everybody, and I have no experience with that. I do believe that there are some GraphQL clients in P with PHP, and to be frank, that could actually be a really interesting concept if you are integrating with Magento, um, be able to use GraphQL. Now, the one thing is, gra again, GraphQL, the big idea behind it is for front-end user interaction, or PWA. 
as such, uh, I am not aware of a way of a mutation to save a product. I'm not aware of a mutation to save a category. Now, I could have missed it, but I'm just not aware of those mutations. So, you know, at that point, you would say that's a missing feature, whatever. But I think ultimately, it just it kind of falls outside of the uh, scope of GraphQL's initial intended functionality. Can it be extended to do that? Absolutely, definitely, hundred percent. But is it what it was originally designed for? I don't think so. Ken, uh, is it because GraphQL is stateless, so sessions should be cleared? It's possible. Like, again, going back to my issue of the customer session being cleared after a GraphQL endpoint, it's possible. But I don't remember that being a problem on or that being done on the REST API. And the REST API also can use the customer session. In, in my opinion, it doesn't make any sense to load the customer session and then to clear it out. Either you don't accept the customer session in the first place or you accept it and don't clear it out, right? I, I, that's that, that's my thinking, but I could be uh, thinking incorrectly on that. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, yeah, Dan said all attributes are loaded. Okay. All right. Uh, so, let's see here. I think, let's go back here. Uh, let's, I think this was actually most of what I wanted to cover today. Uh, we have, yep, I talked about the schema, just making sure I reviewed this, talked about, yep, how to facilitate this on the back end. Again, it's super, super simple. Oh, that's, that, I knew I, I missed writing this note down, but let me, here it is. Let's see here. Uh, we talked about that. I had a couple notes stuck, tucked in another spot here. Oh, yes, and that's one of the things I really wish kind of wish it had. There's no way to associate a REST or GraphQL query to a search criteria builder. That's all done manually. As, and it's really helpful uh, looking through. So if you want a very basic example, we sh I showed you the uh, block lookup in uh, the uh, Magento CMS GraphQL module. We also can come into module catalog, uh, and then look for, where's the GraphQL, uh, module catalog GraphQL, and uh, we can see, well, actually, let's pull this up first, Etsy, GraphQL, search GraphQL, uh, QLS. We see all our queries that are available. We have products, category list, category, et cetera. Uh, so all this is then available, and then we see all the types that are then available here uh, for this. So use this as an example. It gets pretty complex when we start getting into, and let me pull up the example again. Um, oh, let's see, I missed that. Uh, here we go, that's right. This is what happens when I don't organize my notes as well as I should. Okay, so coming back up to Resolver, uh, here we go. And so in this case, it's taking the input query and it's doing a lot more filtering than we were just doing. But at the end of the day, you see the result is the items. Uh, and so there was a question on our Slack channel the other day is, and the question was about how does uh, Magento GraphQL, the, uh, the product query work with uh, layer navigation? And it does seem to work with it with an, to an extent. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'm really sorry, but I am I'm having trouble understanding the uh, uh, or being able to pronounce your name. Uh, Vi uh, Chalisvev, uh, and I, again, I pr apologize. Us English-speaking people uh, have some problems with uh, names across the world. Um, you asked, is GraphQL indeed faster than REST? Uh, so, Dan, thank you for your answer. He says, all attributes are loaded, I assume, for the product uh, query. In that case, no, GraphQL is not faster from the perspective of the data loading. Now, with most everyone on really high-speed internet, GraphQL is not going to save you a huge amount of time by just reducing the number of uh, attributes that are returned for a given query. So at the end of the day, it's probably not going to save a huge amount of download time. Maybe a little bit. <clears throat> All right. So uh, let's see here. There was... I think that was, oh man, I had, I, I, there was one other thing, and I'm, I'm just try, trying to find it in my notes, but I'm not able to find it. So, 
let's jump in to, if there, is there any questions? Be happy to answer them. And if we can't answer them, we're gonna, we'll dive into the code and see what is going on there. So any questions before we wrap this up today? Oh, I see Ken. Will gRPC become available in the future? I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for that. It'll be interesting if it does or not. Any other questions? And uh, while you're doing the questions, I want to put out, again, another plug uh, for the book, um, The Art of E-Commerce Debugging, uh, 40 US dollars plus. Unfortunately, we've had to start charging shipping. We were shipping via uh, USPS. We actually had a couple of books lost. I'm like, screw that. We just can't do that. So we are uh, now shipping via DHL. Books are being delivered in, what, two to five days usually, maybe a little bit longer in some cases, but super fast shipping. Uh, but honestly, it's costing us usually 30 to 40 bucks a book to ship. Ah, so that means that we're, we're, it, there's very little room for error in this. So uh, most of the price that you pay is literally paid, donated directly to DHL. But I do this because I want to see you successful. I want to see you be an expert debugger which means you are going to climb the ranks in your organization. You are going to be able to solve the toughest problems. People in your organization will be coming to you saying, hey, I need your help, which I don't see any way that that could be bad for your career. So order it today if you haven't already. Um, make sure, yeah, make sure you do that. So uh, let's see here, is it indeed, so only the data, only the, yes. Uh, I'm just gonna call you Vi. I hope that's okay if there's a little, uh, um, uh, there's a little nickname there. So, Vi, uh, so yes, only the data that you request is transferred over the wire, over the internet. The, and so in that case, it can reduce latency, it can speed up the process. But maybe you start noticing that if you're loading up a thousand products, maybe, maybe not, I don't know at that point. Um, yes, so all that to say, please, if you haven't already, join me, swiftauto.com slash slack. Folks, we have 1,800 plus people in that community. It's mind blowing. I, and I am so excited because questions are getting answered. Good information. Like Dan, he's one of our rock stars on there. He's a rock star here too. So Dan's on there. We have some great people. Uh, and I, Joseph Leedy is on there. I uh, don't know if Jignesh is on there. Uh, and I'm probably missing a couple of your names as well. But we have some super rock star people there. You got to get in there. You got to join it because there's some really awesome conversation that's going on. So make sure you join join in there, swiftauto.com slash slack. Real quick before we jump off for today, Gene asked, uh, don't you have a digital version of the book? Yes, I do. However, here's my problem with the digital version of the book, and here's why I don't discount the digital version. When you get a digital version of something, be honest with yourself, where, where does it land? It lands in the downloads folder. Are you probably ever going to read it? Again, being honest, likely not. But if you have a book sitting on your desk, you're like, oh, I gotta read this book. I gotta read this book. I gotta read this book. And eventually you'll get this book read, even if it's on a vacation or, I don't know, holiday or something, you just sit down and want some interesting reading. Oh wait, but it's a tech book. Yes, but it is a tech book, but it is interesting. So I don't encourage the digital version uh, just because I want to see people be successful in uh, in reading this, and I think a hardcover is much more likely to get read for most people. For some people, no, they prefer reading digital, and that's why it's available. So uh, there you go. Oh, come on, Dan, if the cat starts chewing on it, <laughs> that would be a problem. We'd have to work out a, like a, 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 a guarantee, an anti-cat guarantee, although that would not be, that would be really mean to do that to cats. So we're not gonna do that to cats. Um, well, if they think it's good food, well, then at least the book has some use and it's cat food. Hmm. That didn't come out sounding right either. <laughs> either way, it has been a pleasure talking with you all today. Thank you for uh, joining our conversation. I hope you learned a lot about GraphQL and, and most importantly, you take the opportunity to just dive in, scratch the surface just a little bit, get comfortable with how to use GraphQL. And even if you don't use it in the wild or legit, Mer use, merchant use case tomorrow or on the PWA, which you would be using it there, you'll, you'll, you'll eventually use it and you'll be really glad that you have started this knowledge journey at this point. Wonderful talking with you all. I hope you have a great week. I look forward to continuing this conversation next month.